Good morning and welcome to Worship at St. Martin's this morning. How are you all? Glad to see you here. So then I'd like to uh, welcome you once again to worship. My name is Keith. I'm one of the ministry team here. This morning I'm here with my colleagues Jordan and Darren and our band and our musician, our, all of our musicians and vocalists, our ushers, uh, our tech team, and we all together seek to engage you in spirit-filled worship this morning. St. Martin's is an affirming congregation of the United Church of Canada. On this, the International Day of Trans Visibility, we are reminded that we have made a commitment to be intentionally welcoming of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, two-spirited, intersex, queer, and questioning people in the life and work of this congregation. So we light this rainbow candle this morning as a symbol and reminder of that commitment. If you are new or visiting with us this morning, we hope you feel warmly welcomed. You have a, uh, if you have questions about how we operate, please seek out someone wearing one of these blue ribbons. Those folks are particularly designated to answer your questions. As congregation members, one of the things that we can do to help people who are new in the congregation is wearing your name tags. If you don't have a name tag, please phone the church office and have Brandy order one for you. They are, uh, there's no cost for them. Our sign says children are welcome and noise is expected and we are particularly welcome children to our worship space and acknowledge the joyful noise that accompanies them. As I mentioned, there's coffee and tea in the lounge. Please uh, quickly go and grab a cup and come back in for the meeting and we will begin as soon as everyone is back in. As part of our affirming status, seeking justice for indigenous people, we begin our worship this morning by acknowledging the land and territory on which we worship. In the spirit of reconciliation, let us acknowledge our relationship with the indigenous people of this land. We acknowledge that we are gathering for worship on the lands of the First Nations and the homeland of the Métis. We are all treaty people bound by the understandings made in the agreement known as Treaty 6. I'm going to invite Katie to light our peace candle this morning. This was a gift from Jordan on her travels from another congregation, and it brings us into solidarity with uh, congregations all over Canada and also around the world who are seeking peace. Thank you. Let's sing. tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on, it. He lays it on its shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. In this piece of scripture from Luke's Gospel, Jesus is criticized for the company he keeps. Rather than back away from his commitment to solidarity with the marginalized, he seeks to help those at the center of power recognize their stake in welcoming and including all. Sometimes our faith commitments place us at odds with the culture around us. It may be easier to forsake our values than to face criticism from our peers. Jesus' example shows us how our choice to live our integrity can help others to expand their understanding of the grace of God. 
This candle represents the challenge of living our convictions. Let us come before God this morning as we share responsibly in our invitation to worship. At times, the road of life can be a dry, lonely place. With open arms, we are welcomed into God's house, finding a reprieve from the road and its hazards. And let's pray together. Ever welcoming God, you assure us that there is a place for all in your loving embrace. May we lean into that danger care, confident and trusting. Remind us again that your way is full of compassion. Open our hearts to the ever-present opportunities to bring hope and comfort to your people. We pray in the name of Jesus, our mentor and guide. Amen. Would the young people like to come to the front, please? But I sh oh no, here it is. I was going to say, did I shut it off when I sat down? That wouldn't be embarrassing. Hi, Mia. How you doing? <laughs> All right. Um, so the story I want to tell today uh, is a story about when I was grocery shopping yesterday. So I was at the grocery store, and uh, I was uh, just walking along, pushing my own cart, and I heard a little boy who was sitting in a cart say, Uncle Carl. And I looked around and there's no one beside me. He was pointing at me. I was a little confused because I am an uncle, but I wasn't an uncle. I'm not an uncle to anyone as young as he was. He was around three, maybe? Yes, and also my name is not Carl. <laughs> so <laughs> there was two things that were wrong with that sentence. <clears throat> so. So I was like a little confused and uh, his mom said, oh, well, his, uh, his Uncle Carl, I guess that, yeah, she said to the boy, I guess that looks a little bit like your Uncle Carl. Apparently there's a guy named Carl in, who lives in Calgary who looks like me, or I look like him. And I, I was wearing my Oilers, uh, Edmonton Oilers hockey jersey. And I said, well, does Uncle Carl cheer for the Oilers? I thought maybe that was why he thought I was Uncle Carl. And she said, well, no, he lives in Calgary, so he doesn't. And she stopped. She said, wait a minute. He does cheer for the Oilers. Even though he lives in Calgary, and Calgary has their own hockey team, and Cal people who live in Calgary generally aren't very um, hospitable to people who uh, cheer for the Edmonton Oilers hockey team. She said, yeah, he does cheer for the Oilers. And in fact, he gets a lot of teasing about it because he cheers for that hockey team. And I thought, hmm, yeah. Uncle Carl sounds like my kind of guy, you know. <laughs> Fight, fighting the system from within kind of thing. So uh, it got me thinking about aunts and uncles because aunts and uncles are like some of the most awesome people that there are. Um, and I know that uh, some of you even here have some pretty awesome aunts. I, I know your aunt, you have an awesome aunt, yeah. <laughs> and, and you are an aunt, you are an awesome aunt. No, sorry. No, it's cousin. cousin, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, I don't know what I'm thinking. Yeah, but yeah, 
you have awesome aunts. And do you have an awesome aunt or uncle? Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, you, 15? Oh, wow. Awesome and uh, a great number, too. Yeah, that's right. Charlotte, do you have an awesome aunt or uncle? Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Mia, do you have an awesome aunt or uncle? You do. Well, look, we've got a clean sweep here. All of you have awesome aunts or uncles. And I know in this congregation, there's some awesome aunts. Uh, Pat Stewart, who was talking, she's an awesome aunt, and you'd have to talk to her nieces and nephews to find out why she's so awesome, but uh, she is. And there's a lot of people here who are just awesome aunts and uncles. And one of the things that we do at our church sometimes is we have a program called Faith Friends, and we have you, uh, we have younger people write to older people um, during the Sundays, and they're like secret letters. And you write, and then the, your secret pen pal, who's usually older than you, will write back, and they'll go, and, and then you can try and uh, figure out who, who you're writing to with, um, even though it's a secret pen pal. And at the end of oh, usually about four weeks, you find out uh, who it is. So it's, um, it's kind of a fun program because you get sometimes uh, another fun aunt or uncle, or sometimes it's an older person, sometimes it's a fun grandma or grandpa, and you get to email them. And then after the program's done, you know someone else in the church, so when you come to church on Sunday, you can say, hi. And there's an extra person who is an extra fun aunt or uncle or fun grandpa and grandma that you know from the church. So, if any of you want to participate in that program, let me know, yeah, okay? Um, and I will uh, make sure that I organize it for you and I put you on the list and I match you up. So we'll be doing that the next few weeks and uh, we'll have a, a fun party to celebrate um, when we find out who our faith friends are. Friends, we're going to say our prayer for reconciliation responsively it's it comes from psalm 32 happy are those whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered while i kept silence my body wasted away in groaning all day long Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. A reading from Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. <clears throat> a few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and, had, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to and, and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and he went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine that was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he, was, he got him back safe and sound. Then he came, became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen. For all those years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me a young goat so I might celebrate with my friends. But when his, this son of yours comes back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then his father said to him, Son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because your brother, this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the testimony from our ancestors of faith. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God of love, be in my words, be in our listening, be in each one of our hearts to receive the wisdom you have for us this day. Amen. The story of the prodigal son is a very familiar one. We're not going to go through the whole thing, but just highlight that it points to the truth that no matter what we do, we cannot put ourselves outside of God's love. That's a, a very clear, explicit message in this parable, that the son who's gone off, has told off, has, has completely insulted and abandoned his father and goes off and then kind of gets himself into trouble and comes back is welcomed like an honored guest and is just fully embraced by grace. But it ends problematically for us. If the story just ended with the party, we could all just be like, woo, right? But it doesn't end there because there's another brother and the other brother comes in and hears the party going on and it's like, what's going down? And it's like, oh, there's a party for my brother who took off and was a jerk. And now he's getting a party. And the, the father comes out and, and invites the son in and, and extends that same grace like, son, Everything I've got is yours. You are fully embraced by my love, just as your brothers. Come on in and join the party. And that's where it ends. We don't know what the older son decides to do. That's Jesus' point. Jesus is leaving us with the question, what is he going to do? Because, friends, that is the very question Jesus is asking us. What are we going to do? Are we going to choose to embrace this economy of grace that says no one gets left out, no one is ever outside of God's love, no matter what? Or are we going to cling to our notions that, that there are lines, there are lines you can't cross and come back from, that there are good people and bad people, in people and out people? Are, are we, when we feel like one of the in people and we want to keep others as out people, are we going to say yes to God's economy of grace that embraces absolutely everyone? That's the question posed to us today. 
And I, of course, am not going to answer that question, but I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story that uh, I encountered when I was up in Whitehorse. And I, I actually asked permission of the young child in this story to share this story because I was so moved by their courage and by their grace. And so moved by, well, I'm just going to tell you the story and you'll see why I was moved. So there was a young child by the, who was named Tristan. And Tristan uh, was not a happy child. Uh, I spoke with Tristan's parents and they said, yeah, for the first four or five years, Tristan was just kind of morose, just seemed a little depressed. They were worried about Tristan. And Tristan had started school and things seemed to be getting worse. So Tristan's five years old, has begun kindergarten and is not a happy camper. And the Christmas holidays roll around and grandma and grandpa come to visit and one of the things that they get into while there is they get up into the attic and they start going through all the stuff that's in the attic. And Tristan's up there in the attic and comes across a trunk and opens up the trunk and in it is all of this fabulous, what I would call a tickle trunk. It's just got all these awesome clothes and fun dress up stuff. And Tristan reaches in and pulls out this magnificent tutu and a tiara and Tristan's eyes just get big and he puts the tiara on his head and he pulls on the tutu and he goes running downstairs and pirouettes into the living room in front of grandpa and grandpa says oh look it's Tristina and Tristan says no grandpa it's Tristana and grandpa said oh it's Tristana and Tristana said yes and proceeded to dance around the house. Grandpa clued in very, very quickly to what was happening, as did Tristana's parents. Um, and and they, they sat Tristana down and they said, Tristana, are you a girl? And she said, yes, I am. Yes, I am. He said, okay, we need to make a phone call. And they phoned their minister. And they said, um, Tristan's a girl, and we need some help. So the minister came over, and they, they established a plan for what they were going to do when school started up again in January, and how they were going to introduce this to the teachers and to the school, who I'm happy to report were fabulous about the whole thing. But then the minister also said, okay, and so we want to make Tristana's uh, reintroduction, I guess, into the congregation as smooth and as welcoming as possible. So the minister said, don't worry about this, I will handle it. And uh, I will, uh, they agreed that all questions would go to the minister, they wouldn't have everybody phoning the parents to, to get answers about what was happening, but they'd go to the minister. So the minister went home and phoned the Sunday school teachers and filled them in and said, can you please make an effort to to introduce Tristana as Tristana, and um, if there are any questions, they can come to me. And if you have, you know, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to act, ask, and um, kind of laid the groundwork. But the minister was worried about one person, only one person. We'll call him Jack. Jack was uh, like ex-military and he'd, and he'd been a lumberjack and he, he'd kind of a rough and tumble kind of guy and he was a sound guy. And he was also the guy who got the name tags made up for the congregation. Um, and the minister was just a little bit concerned that Jack was somebody who spoke his mind quite freely and often spoke his mind before really thinking through what he might be saying. And so the minister was quite concerned that Jack was going to say something hurtful to Tristana when Tristana showed up in a dress on Sunday. And so uh, before the service, the minister went and spoke to Jack, who was there early, and said, Jack, so Tristan is now Tristana. And uh, Tristan, Tristana, is a girl, has always been a girl. We're only just discovering that now. Jack said, 
So you are saying that that little boy is a little girl? Just, that's right. You're saying that Tristan is now going by Tristana? That's right. Jack thought about that for a minute and said, well, we're going to need to get that little girl a new name tag. We are constantly being invited into God's economy of grace. May we be people who can accept God's welcome of us no matter where we've come from or what we've done. And may we be people who can extend that welcome and that acceptance to others so that everyone feels free to join the party. Amen. Friends, as you heard Keith mention in the opening, today is International Day of Visibility for Transgender People. And so I invite you to say together responsively this litany that was prepared by Mr. Barb Griff. Blessed are the trailblazers who brought us this far and are still trailblazing, still celebrating. Blessed are the gender benders, those who challenge us to reframe our gender paradigm. Blessed are the young ones who present fearlessly from the start. Blessed are their parents who make space for freedom and love their children fiercely. Blessed are the siblings and relatives who educate, support, and love us as we are. Blessed are the gender queer youth who are struggling and persist. Blessed are the 90-year-olds just coming out and those who have been out for decades. Blessed are those whose lives were cut too short. May their stories live on through us. Blessed are the survivors. May they keep on living. Blessed are the allies, learning to be accomplices. Blessed are those gathered here today, witnessing, learning, celebrating. May we all commit to continuing to show up, fighting for justice, celebrating all the genders in life. Let us pray. God, you are the one who loves prodigally. So teach us, we pray, to learn to love in something like your way, with a reckless extravagance, with a luxuriant and lavish wastefulness. We give thanks for those fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers, friends and others, who have given us in our own lives a taste of that kind of love, a love that runs out to welcome us home, no matter how far we have wandered. We pray that through our faltering efforts, Others may come to know that welcome, may come to know themselves home again. We give you thanks, God, for the feasts we have sat down to enjoy, for the celebrations we've been able to serve up, for the invitations we have been given to share in the joy of reunion and life renewed. We pray in quietness for those known to us for whom life's fare has become bitter tasteless or harsh through loss or betrayal, through illness or grief, through resentment or anger. Touch them with a healing touch, we pray. And if you will, use our hands, our words, our presence to make that touch real for them. We pray for Abdul, Aaron, Lorna, Joyce, Jean, Dorothy, Margaret, Jean, Leo, Kay, and all of their families. We pray also for the families of Edith Davis and Jean Leach. Loving God, most prodigal of parents, you give your beloved child so that we might find life through him, the life of abundance and fullness that is your deepest dream for us. Through Christ you call us friends 
And with Christ's open arms, you embrace us and welcome us home again and again. Grant that in all our living, day by day, we may prove faithful ambassadors of Christ, faithful bearers and sharers of that life and love. In his name, we bring these prayers, spoken and silent, in the words he taught us, we pray together. Our Mother and our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. (laughs) Friends, go out into the world to accept God's invitation to join the party whether you are the one being received home or whether you are the one being received to let go of whatever stops you from going in and welcoming others, Mm -hmm. know that you are blessed by God and that you are called to be a blessing to God's world. Amen. Amen.